Welcome to 50 Plus in Montgomery County, a program that is a voice for many produced by the Commission on Aging, of which I am a community member. While the show is insightful for people of all ages, each episode takes a fresh look at important issues by spotlighting older adults in the community, representatives of services and programs, and activities of interest to older adults. My name is Katie. You know, the holiday season is a wonderful time of year that many spend with their family or friends. Today, we will talk about a few of the customs that reverberate annually, such as Christmas and Hanukkah to welcome the holiday season, including the beautiful and personalized ways that bring us joy all year long. Joining me to discuss Hanukkah, also known as the Festival of Lights, is Rabbi Fred Sherlander Dow. Rabbi Fred has served as the rabbi at Adat Shalom Reconstructionist Congregation in Bethesda since 1997. At Adat Shalom, Rabbi Fred and his team are committed to creating a vibrant spiritual community for individuals of diverse backgrounds. Hi, Rabbi Fred. Hello, and thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad to talk to you today. You know, Rabbi Fred, let's begin with a more introductory approach. Tell us what is Hanukkah. So happy to kick off this segment uh, with per, um, debatably the oldest of these traditions, although to state the obvious winter solstice was the common birth of so many. We are all in this together, a theme from beginning to end. Hanukkah in particular celebrates something in the late biblical period. So it's not actually in the core Bible. Um, it's in the Apocrypha, which were originally Hebrew books that were not canonized in the Hebrew Bible, but kept in the Catholic and other traditions. The Book of Maccabees tells the story where in 167 BCE, the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great has split into three. And the one that is in the Middle East um, is uh, uh, called the Seleucids. There's a mean king and they're uh, sort of not practicing a lot of religious pluralism or tolerance. And uh, there's an uprising among some of the Jews. It's a little more complicated than that, but uh, it takes four years of guerrilla warfare and they win, which is no small thing. Um, and then they go back to Jerusalem, they clean up and reconsecrate the temple with great fanfare, and we celebrate that. So Hanukkah literally means dedication. It's actually related to the word for education. So it is, a, it is remembering when we got to reclaim the temple. And there's something really timeless there about whether we have a physical space or not, what it means to reclaim the core pieces of our identity, the collective parts of our past that are deepest. And I would put that forward as a gift for all of us because you don't have to be Jewish and celebrate Hanukkah to appreciate that there's something about rededication to core values and histories and principles that goes with this season. Hmm. You know, tell me some of, what are some of your favorite themes in light of rededication? So uh, thematically, and I'll talk about the ritual later, I'll give a, a, a quick uh, hint that there's, you know, Hanukkiot and dreidels and all this other fun stuff that we'll get to. Um, but uh, in terms of themes, it's a bit of a timeless, um, malleable holiday. So back in the American Revolution time, there were only about 2,500 Jews to the best of scholars ability um, at the time of Washington and, and Hamilton and those folks. But uh, clearly Hanukkah struck a chord because here was a guerrilla uprising against a perceived, um, you know, a, a much stronger perceived empire, uh, very similar to the Hanukkah history. So that was reclaimed in the 20th century um, as the uh, moving toward the state of Israel and a, a renascent Jewish presence in that homeland, challenging as that political, social, demographic reality has been, the story took on new urgency there as well. These days, um, there's so many ways to take it and make it modern. And I have two favorites. Um, the first is our, the top issue for all of us is climate change. If we ignore it, we are consigning our descendants to a living hell. Um, it is that simple. It needs to be the clarion call of people of faith and people of conscience everywhere. So the, the famous story about the one little jar of oil that's good for one day, lasting eight, until they could get the olive presses going and, uh, and have new sanctified oil in the temple, 
Um, that miracle, which by the way, doesn't appear in the text until hundreds of years after the actual event. So take it with a grain of salt historically, but the idea that one unit of oil lasts eight times longer, that is a 700% increase in fuel efficiency, right? Literally, it's about burning less oil to get the same amount of light. And the, that is something that just speaks in our day with the COP26 in Scotland negotiating our collective future just completed. We need to get Maccabean. <laughs> we need to get incredibly serious about our energy efficiency and about retooling for a, a carbon conscious and methane conscious future. So the Maccabees maybe didn't think they were giving us that gift, but they did. Um, the other is this religious pluralism question because the history is a lot more complicated than Sunday school curricula make it out. The reality is that the group of Jews who took up arms against the Greek Syrians, the Seleucid empire were the extremists. They were the back, they were the fundamentalists. They might have been the Taliban in their own day, right? And there were actually plenty of accommodationist, more secular Jews who spoke Greek as well as Hebrew and said, the Greek influence isn't so bad. I don't like the excesses. Um, and as with every civil war, there was that angle too. And it's really interesting today, if we did a sober analysis of what was going on back then, how many of us would have been Maccabees and how many of us would have actually stuck with the secular majority and opposed the extremists within our ranks? So his, you know, history is written by the winners. So the Maccabees come out looking good, um, but the reality is a lot more complicated than that. So both for the empire at the time, had they avoided the excesses of insisting that there's one way to do things and one kind of religion and one kind of values, had they been just a bit more pluralistic, all that bloodshed would have been avoided. And I think there's lessons there for every government today, including our own. At the same time, we all have co-religionists who are a bit more fundamentalist than we are. And there's something important to say about finding a middle way that is neither the passivity of accepting the hegemony of this empire, but also not taking up arms against your fellows who don't agree with you and against the government. Then, so I would say that, uh, you know, Gandhi and practicing Satragaha as he's been teaching since 1905, Dr. King and others brought that into the civil rights movement here on these shores. And we need to find that sacred middle way, which is not at all passive is absolutely value centric, but is committed to nonviolence. And in that sense, we have to update the Maccabean story. That's very interesting, Rabbi Frag. Tell me about this. You said that Hanukkah is a, a timeless tradition. What would you say about the intergenerational aspects of Hanukkah, specifically the role that grandparents, friends, and other extended family members play in helping us to you know, navigate the middle way, as well as being more efficient with our unit of oil. Right. So as one of the later holidays on the Jewish calendar, commemorating a post-biblical thing, Hanukkah is not one of the top 10 religious things in the Jew Jewish calendar, but it's one of the top two or three most celebrated because it's a home-based tradition. There's something incredibly powerful about a tradition that often tells us exactly what to do and when, for eight nights, you just have to come home as quickly as practicable, close to sunset, and put the menorah in the window, public facing, to publicize the miracle. So it's thanks to God for these miracles. It's also a reminder of human power, human ingenuity um, as well. So doing that with a very short and accessible ceremony and with lots of fun things with foods, with, uh, with toys, the dreidel and all kinds of fun things like that. Um, it, it is a place where memories are impressed going all the way back to ages two, three, four um, and throughout childhood. Those intergenerational moments that modernity so often lacks as we are now so spread out, um, anytime we can get together intergenerationally, it is a gift 
that we give, I would say, as someone recently 50 plus myself, um, that we give for ourselves to have that youth energy around us, but we also give to them two and three and four generations down the line by being a, a beloved elder in their presence and celebrating with them and enabling that warmth and that sense of family and that sense of values to all be connected. So whether you have your own grandchildren in the area or not, or whether you do it on Zoom, whether you are a, a biological or an honorary auntie or uncle um, to uh, any number of people, uh, and including in the community, just getting involved in your local synagogue and the, the power when you um, have like a tinfoil covered table and 30 of these all alight at the same time, it's amazing. Um, so bring yours and add to the light, uh, and especially for the children in your life, it is a huge gift. Finally, you know, can you briefly share your thoughts about the interfaith context of Hanukkah and Christmas in our last two minutes? Okay, so um, I promised the, the setup, you can see that Hanukkah can be artsy or, or cultural or simple. Um, in back, you see the seven branch, that's actually the uh, Kinara, from Kwanzaa, which is very similar to the biblical menorah and the winter festival of Kwanzaa um, with African roots and core in the African-American community is something beautiful. We happen to be a multiracial family, so we can celebrate it sort of honestly, um, but, um, but I would say all of us should come together for Kwanzaa and for Christmas and for Hanukkah. Diwali was a little early this year, but that too, right? Like uh, all of it. And Ramadan, of course, floats throughout the solar year. So it's not nearby right now, but it will be again. We are all in this together. And so the this idea of bringing light into the darkness um, is, is ultimately the core lesson here, that when there is darkness around us, you don't curse it you gather with others, you organize, and you bring light. And that is the core teaching that cuts across all of it. So we are truly in it together and whatever you celebrate, even if it's only solstice um, in this season, um, then um, happy holidays, but that's, that doesn't even begin to scratch it, right? That may be better when you don't know the religion than saying Merry Christmas or Happy Hanukkah or anything else, but deeper than happy holidays, be the light, bring the light. Thank you. I like that, Rabbi Fred. You know, thanks so much for taking the time and showing us how we can be the light and bring the light. How can we stay in contact with you? Uh, adatshalom.net, N-E-T. Our synagogue in West Bethesda is open to all. I can be a resource along the way, uh, particularly around climate change and religion. Uh, Greater Washington Interfaith Power and Light is a particularly powerful uh, follow-up for that. It's ipldmv.org, where people of all faiths gather to think about saving the climate and our future together. Um, so there's a lot of places to follow up, including with your own community, your own spiritual advisor. And if you don't have one, give us a call. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, Fred. Awesome. Blessings. Up next, we will talk with Reverend Ann Dursey, who is a deacon and minister for community engagement at the St. John Norwood Episcopal Church. The Beacon Newspaper's Virtual 50 Plus Expo will offer an extravaganza of information for the area's older adults and their families. The event will take place on an easy to use website offering free access to speakers on a variety of health and financial topics, including our keynoter, Diane Ream, classes including exercise, cooking, and more. Entertainers ranging from comedians and rock and roll singers to Broadway and classical music, plus 50 government agencies, nonprofits, and businesses offering services and products designed for older adults. All of this will be available free of charge 24-7 for a full three months from Monday, November 1st through January 31st. And valuable door prizes will be awarded throughout the period. More than 9,000 people visited our virtual expo last year on their computer, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Don't miss out this year. Make a note now to visit beacon50expo.com. Again, that's beacon, B-E-A-C-O-N, 50expo.com starting November 1st. Sponsored by AARP Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. Welcome back to 50 Plus in Montgomery County. 
Here to talk about how people around the world celebrate Christmas in their own way is Reverend Ann Dursey. Reverend Ann is a deacon and minister for community engagement at the St. John Norwood Episcopal Church. She serves at St. John after a 30 year one career as a diplomat, living abroad in Trinidad, Singapore, Korea, the Philippines, Belgium, Iraq, Azerbaijan, and Lithuania. She's focused on helping people find the best ways to give their gifts of faith, talent, life, and professional experience to serve. Hi, Reverend Ann. Good morning, Katie. How are you? I'm so happy to be here with you at this festive season and say good morning to you and to everyone watching. I'm happy to talk to you too, Reverend Ann. Good morning. You know, before we talk about the displays of Christmas and how it's celebrated, let's start with you. Tell us, what are your Christmas memories? What Christmas traditions did you grow up with? Oh, thank you. Well, Christmas is a very special time of year for, for me, not just because I am a Christian, but also because my family came from, my father's family came from Germany and France, and my mother's family came from Norway and Germany. And so we have a lot of Christmas traditions that come from that European uh, background. And I grew up in the Middle West, in Chicago and in Wisconsin. And so my memories of Christmas are very much tied up in sort of the, the traditions you often see in books and on postcards, you know, lots of snow, lots of pine trees, Christmas trees, skating, sledding, hot chocolate fires, and then of course getting up on Christmas morning to lots of presents under the Christmas tree. Um, my great grandfather was also a Norwegian Lutheran pastor in Northern Wisconsin. So my grandmother, uh, was uh, raised in a, in a very uh, religious tradition. So we also have special religious uh, things we would do on Christmas Eve. For example, we always went to a midnight mass in the church. And I just remember as a little girl attending this ser service at night, it would be cold, it snowed a lot at that time. And we would go into the, into the, uh, into the church and hear the hymns and everyone was given a small candle a real candle. And when I was a little child, you know, that was very exciting. And as the service wound down around midnight, the lights in the church would go down and all of the candles would be illuminated. And it was just such a moving and beautiful experience to introduce Christmas Day. So those are some of my memories of Christmas. Mm. Now, Reverend Ann, as a former ambassador who lived in other places around the world, can you share with us how Christmas was celebrated and adopted in some of those local cultures. Well, thank you very much. And I, I just explained to you that my personal experience of Christmas was this very wintry, cold, uh, snowy uh, kind of background. So when I went as a young foreign service officer to my first overseas assignment in Trinidad and Tobago, which is a beautiful tropical island, I experienced for the first time a tropical Christmas. And uh, I went after that to Singapore and the Philippines, also tropical places, and had their experiences of Christmas. Very, very different from what I experienced in the Middle West. Um, at that time of year in December, in those tropical countries, it's beautiful weather. It's very warm, it's not raining. The tropical rains are over. People are outside in the streets. And it's an especially, uh, joyous time of year in cultures where beautiful music and lots of gaiety is kind of part of the tradition and the culture. And in Trinidad, for example, I'm sure you've heard of Trinidadian music like Calypso and Soca. Those traditions blended with the tradition coming from Venezuela called uh, Parang, which is a very special kind of music that's played at Christmas time when people go out and about and do Christmas caroling, just like they do in, in some of the Western countries. And then in the Philippines, I remember the Filipinos have a very strong um, tradition, Christian tradition, Roman Catholicism. They uh, attend service, they attend mass every night for nine days, I believe it is, before Christmas. And then they also have a midnight mass tradition. But one of the most exciting things about the Philippines is how the people decorate there. They make beautiful decorations called uh, paroles, which are typically made out of a translucent seashell and nowadays often with cellophane. And all over the country, you'll see these beautiful paroles. They also set up almost every home from the most humble to the most grand will have a beautiful crash or nativity scene 
depicting the Christmas story there in the Philippines. And it's a time of year that, where people are visiting each other, they're eating great feasts, they're, you know, the kinds of things we associate with Christmas, right? Family, friends, happiness. Uh, the Philippines is a, is a culture that exhibits all of those things and at Christmas, it's especially wonderful. Yeah, that's interesting. Can you capture any other different expressions of Christmas during this joyful time of the year? Absolutely. I mean, I mentioned, um, or you mentioned that I had served also in Europe. And so when I was living in Brussels, for example, we, we would travel to Germany for a very special Christian for a very special Christmas tradition there, which is a living crèche. And there were some small towns just across the border from where we lived in Brussels. And, and these small towns in Germany would set up a beautiful living crèche where they had people and animals, you know, and an outdoor manger depicting the nativity scene of the birth of Jesus. And people in the small villages would have processions with candlelight to visit the, the crash. And it was a very moving experience. And in other parts of Germany and in Brussels, what one thing that's very big at Christmas time is Christmas markets, which are uh, places people come to gather. They have great Christmas treats, roast chestnuts, crepes, and they, uh, they sell artisanal things that people have made, Christmas ornaments or, all kinds of gifts that people have handmade that you can buy for friends and family. And those Christmas markets are just places that are full of joy and friendship and, and lots of fun and good food. And often there'll be carolers and singers there too. So the Christmas markets I remember particularly from Europe. You know, what you're describing is definitely putting me in a festive mood. And this time of year is known as a, a, a time of giving. Tell me what's the best present you've ever received, as well as the best present you've ever given. Well, I think that the best present that I've ever given is the experience of Christmas for my children. We lived all over the world. We traveled from place to place. We were often far from family and friends at Christmas time. But Christmas for us has always been a very special family time. When we were together in whatever foreign country we might be living in, it was when we really felt that sense of the importance of family and the warmth of family around us. So that's the, probably the best Christmas present that I've ever given. And I, I re received so many wonderful Christmas presents through my life that I couldn't pick out a best one. But I can tell you the first one that I remember and how excited I was about it. And that was when I was about four or five years old living in, I think it was in Chicago, Illinois. And I had one thing that I really, really wanted. And I was just old enough then to wake up on Christmas morning, all excited to see if that present would be under the tree. And I woke up before my parents did, and I made my way down the stairs to the family room where there was a gorgeous Christmas tree. And the sun was just coming up, shining on that tree. And I was looking for that special present. And you know what? It was there. And you know what it was? It was a Sleeping Beauty doll. You remember the, the stories of Sleepy Beauty um, and the Disney figure and, and this beautiful doll with a beautiful blue dress and a golden tiara. And that's my earliest memory of receiving a Christmas present that I was just dying to get and receive. So, Well, speaking of receiving and giving, before we depart, are there any words of advice that you would like to share with our viewers as I think about celebrating this season and then what Christmas means to you. Thank you very much for that question. And yes, actually there is because, well, I'm sure you know that Christmas for Christians is, is a very important and joyous celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. And so there's a spiritual side to this for me that's very, very important as a Christian. But I'd also like to say that there's something really universal about the spirit of Christmas that I think is shared by all our other great faith traditions and shared even by people of no particular faith tradition, but people of goodwill. And that there are some things that we just all yearn for. And at Christmas, we feel that in the spirit of Christmas. And those things are, well, first of all, light in the darkness. I mean, light in the virtual darkness because we're approaching the winter solstice and it's the darkest time of year. And right now in the United States of America, 
we've experienced a dark period uh, with COVID and with some of our political divisions. And so it's been a difficult time for our country. So at this time of year, we think about light, light in the darkness. And that to me is extremely important. And then we think about peace at Christmas as well. It's a time when in a world that we know is too riven by conflict and division and violence often, this is a time when we can step back and think about peace and how we should be working together to achieve it as people. And then there's the issue of, well, caring for one another. Christmas is quintessentially a family holiday, but it's when we think about ourselves as part of the human family and we really reach out and we give and we care for one another. And that moment of love and caring for others is an extremely enriching one for us all spiritually, no matter what faith you are. And lastly, I would say we have the issue of hope and faith. And again, for Christians, this is the birth of Jesus Christ. So it's a very important spiritual moment for us, but there is something greater than all of us. And I think at Christmas time, there is a universal spirit that we feel. And that's a spirit of, of love and truth and justice and caring. And this is a time when we can remember and feel that there is something greater than we are. And that if we work and strive to approach that spirit of goodness, that we can make a difference in the world. And do I have one more minute to give you a, a, a picture to keep in your mind through the Christmas season that I think is really important? Absolutely, Reverend Ann. I'd like to describe, well, this is not my original idea. This comes actually from a monk and an abbot named Dorotheus who lived in Gaza in the 500s. And this monk, described the world as, as follows. He said, think of the world as a circle or a big wheel. And at the center of the wheel is God or this universal spirit of goodness and mercy and justice and light. And then all of the spokes on the wheel are the different ways that people live and worship. And if you think about moving closer to the center of the circle, closer towards God, at the same time, you're moving closer to other people as you move up the spokes towards the center. And I often think of that when I think of the Christmas star. So I hope that everyone who's listening here today will have a wonderful holiday season, whatever faith you celebrate. And if you're a, a Christian, a Merry Christmas. And think about that. Think about approaching as we approach the spirit, universal spirit of goodness, what it means to us as we approach other people too, and what we can do to make a difference in the world. Reverend Ann, you are awe inspiring. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with us. And how can we stay in contact with you? Well, I work at St. John's Norwood Episcopal Church in Bethesda Chevy Chase, Maryland. And you can reach me there. Okay, so it's A Dersey, so A D E R S E, at St. John's Norwood.org. And St. John's Norwood is all one word. Okay? Thanks so much, Reverend Ann. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity and have a great holiday season. You too. Well, that concludes our program for today on Hanukkah and Christmas and how the holiday season tends to bring light and joy to many in various ways. As you can see, the voices of those 50 plus matter every day and in every way. To learn more about services for seniors in Montgomery County, please visit the Montgomery County Seniors website by visiting montgomerycountymd.gov slash senior or call the Senior Resources line at 240-777-3000. And no matter how you celebrate the season, we wish you a happy holidays. And as always, thank you for watching 50 Plus in Montgomery County. Did you know that seniors who are 65 and older, as well as persons with disabilities, can ride free all the time on Ride On, Ride On Extra, Flash, and Flex? Just show your senior Smart Trip card, a Medicare card and photo ID, or a Metro Disability card, and we'll take you where you need to go. All the county's buses are wheelchair accessible. For more information, call 311 or visit rideonbus.com.